Hello, and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer, and on today's episode, we've got a great guest. Now, that's not unique, but the type of guest that we've got today is someone who we don't usually get to speak with. Dr. Jenny Byrne is a PhD, an MD, an author, an entrepreneur, a leader, and the chief patient officer at Belong Health. She's got this incredible success story and an awesome resume. You're going to learn a lot from her. And we're going to be talking about equity, mental and behavioral health, and the future of work, all timely issues and things that we really should be addressing right now. So let's not waste another minute. Work Inspired starts right now. Dr. Jenny, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Excited to speak to you and to learn from you. Really appreciate your insight and your time. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's start with your professional story. Tell us, uh, how did you get to where you're at today? You you have a lot in your resume um, and interested to know kind of what what led you to uh, co-founding Belong Health. Well, I think... Like many people, my path has not really been very linear. So Mm. I've had a pretty meandering path. I was not a kid who said they wanted to be a doctor when they grew up. So I had a detour into music performance. I was actually went into college as a musician, switched gears and became a French major because I wanted to live overseas. And then I really didn't find my way until late when I landed in a class called um, biological behavior, uh, biological basis of behavior. And it was all about brain brain and behavior. And I just fell in love. So I would say everything I've done since then has been around brain and behavior in some way. So I did a PhD in neurophysiology, went on to train as a doctor and uh, became a psychiatrist did a lot of clinical practice, uh, solopreneured a psychiatry practice over about nine year period, got involved in uh, more state level work here in North Carolina, where I live in Medicaid, um, again, mostly in mental health, and then went to work for Caremore, um, doing national level behavioral health, and then went to take on specialty and other stuff. So I would say everything I've done that brought me to belong was around brain and behavior. And then, you know, during the pandemic, I think a lot of us had a reckoning of what was really meaningful to us. Mm-hmm. And the, the folks at belong, I think we were very aligned. We felt like, um, you know, nationally in our country, more than 11 million people don't get the healthcare that they need. And that's personally devastating often for individuals, but it's also really bad for our society and creates a lot of cost and headaches and honestly kind of moral injury for us Mm -hmm. as a community. So this population that we call complex in the healthcare world, you know, they, they use a lot of healthcare, they get very sick, they have low incomes, they're older, they're disabled, they have a lot of pre-existing conditions and they uh, qualify sometimes for Medicare and Medicaid together. So, so I was really interested in what the founders um, at Belong were doing to try to take care of these individuals because the current system of care is just so convoluted and siloed. It's a lot. I mean, it's almost impossible to navigate, honestly. Um, and so individuals often get lost or they just skip out on health care and they don't get preventative care. And so they get sicker and worse. So mm. we really wanted to found belong because we, we felt like there was a better way to have a kinder, a more equitable and a more cost effective approach to health care and to really be at the forefront of the future of health care, the evolution of health care to take care of these individuals. Incredible. So you're so in, in college, you've kind of decided that your passion or your interest was the way we think, the the, the mental health, the, the the science of the brain. Is that um, with belong? Is that a piece of what belong does? Is it both physical and mental well being that you guys um, provide? Yeah, we so we take care of the whole person. So mm-hmm. we take care of everything, mental health, physical health, uh, social, what they call social determinants of health, which are other things that affect you. But 
Well, one of the things that makes us different is we use behavioral science mm. and kind of psychology and, and humans and the way our brains work to really inform everything we do. So whether that's care management, working with an individual, or figuring out how best to help providers, um, everything we do really has that brain and behavior focus. And the framework we use is called behavioral science, which is a really interesting way to think about problems that people are facing. Yeah, I, and you mentioned the pandemic. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of work in the corporate world and regarding the workplace. Before the pandemic, a lot of wellness was, the talk was around physical well-being. But it seems yeah. like the pandemic really shifted the focus to also include mental and emotional well-being. And so tell me a little bit more about um, what does that, what, what is, what does that encompass? What, what does that look like when you're looking at the, the entire, you know, the entire person, their, their total well-being? Yeah, so it's really interesting if you're someone who geeks out on history or philosophy, you know, if you go back, the brain-body divide is this ancient philosophical debate right? Where the brain is, the body, the soul. But in more modern times, um, we've divided the two. Um, and mm -hmm. there's kind of a whole history behind that. But it's impossible to divide your brain from your body <laughs> and your nervous system from your body. So um, the fact that it was divided in our healthcare system or the way we talked about health was really artificial. And mm -hmm. now I think with the pandemic, um, in part because it was, you know, COVID had impact on our brain and our body. So I think there was this awakening to the idea that mental health and physical health go together. You can't have one without the other. And we're more willing to talk about mental health than we were before. So it's not a new concept. So to a mm -hmm. psychiatrist or a therapist like me, this is not news, but to, I think there's um, less stigma and more need more urgency to talk about it mm. is something like the pandemic did it create more problem with mental health with mental well-being or did it just did it just shine light on what was already there i think both i think it shined mm. light on problems that were already there already in mm -hmm. our system problems in the system problems in our communities problems in our workplaces but right. there was this added layer of stress and uncertainty that I think did exacerbate um, things, especially like depression, anxiety, and substance use. And also with COVID, you know, many, most people have had COVID at some point mm -hmm. now in the last couple of years, some people, unfortunately, did, it did impact their brain and mm -hmm. the long COVID. And so we are seeing some impact of that. but the verdict is still out on, you know, if that is, is irreversible, but um, I think it was already there, but there's definitely this, this acknowledgement that life is uncertain. That certainly, mm -hmm. I think many of us tried to ignore, or we didn't really want to think about, but then the pandemic just threw it in our face and forced us to acknowledge just how uncertain and transient and change ever changing our lives can be. Sure. You guys, and, and what are you seeing now? I mean, we're in an interest, interesting place here in 2023 where things seem fairly back to normal. You know, I think faster than some of us thought that they would be after, you know, the initial thinking that the pandemic would never last for a couple of years. But after the isolation and, you know, the physical health, you know, health scares of the pandemic, now we can, to some extent, get back to the way things were before the pandemic. But, you know, like you said, there's been a reprioritization and people have maybe new right. perspective, you know, and also maybe some lingering physical, you know, or, um, you know, or to whatever extent brain impact from, from what we just all went through. So where are we at today? Are you seeing things getting better? Are you seeing still a massive need for uh, the type of uh, care that Belong Health provides? I think that. What we're seeing is a major point of inflection for the society, both in healthcare mm. and in the workplace. And there's, I'm an optimist. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I think it's an opportunity. 
So kind of that never waste a crisis. I feel like we have this opportunity. And when people say things go back to normal, I think we're starting to see these questions about, well, was normal really that great? Like, Mm. was normal working for me and my family or my, if I'm a doctor, was was normal really what I want to do for the next 10, 15 years and for the patients seeking healthcare? Like, was our health really that great or are we just kind mm. of in this big, messy system? And so there's a desire to be kind of quote unquote normal, but there's also this awakening to the assumptions that we all had and maybe normal actually wasn't so great. So I think there's a desire for more equity. Mm-hmm kind of Mm -hmm. everywhere, whether that's healthcare, the workplace. And, you know, the reality is that workplace was not very equitable, uh, you know, quote in the quote unquote normal or what I call the traditional office and healthcare is not Mm -hmm. that equitable. Um, And I think Mm -hmm. we're awakening to that and starting to really wrap our heads around what that means. And then hopefully moving quickly towards things that are more equitable. That's, that's my hope. Well, let's uh, let's dig into that. You're uh, the chief patient officer at Belong Health. Uh, yep. and clearly, that is looking after the patient. What makes a great patient experience? Because I think we can translate that to some extent to employee experience or even customer experience. What do you consider a great patient experience? The first thing I love to talk about is trust. So whether that's I mean, with your healthcare provider, that's super important, right? So as a psychiatrist and a therapist, I trained on trust, right? How do you get someone to trust you very quickly and be willing to share their most painful moments with you in therapy, you know, very quickly? So that's something that we train in. And I think the idea of trust is really, really relevant for everything, for client relationships, for employee relationships. So trust is something that... Um, the first thing about trust is that people trust in different ways. And so what I find often in the workplace, especially kind of corporate America, is that most people think trust operates on competency, like you do what you say you're going to do. And so I trust you. And that is one form of trust. But there are other ways that people trust. Um, Some people trust more heavily on integrity. Um, You know, how how much do you adhere to a value system? Some people trust more deeply on likability or or how much you have in common with me. I can trust you if I have a lot in common with you. And then some people trust on, do you have my back? Are you proactively doing things to show me that you're there and you kind of have my back? So human beings trust in different ways. Most of us have all three, but we might favor one more than the other. So First step is to work with the patient and the great experience comes from trust. Mm -hmm. Can you trust me? How do I demonstrate and build trust? Um, And that can be through my actions, but it can be through other things as well. So I think trust building is one of the major things that we need to do right up front with our patients and with clients and even with our own staff is like really build the trust. Um, And then the other thing that makes a great experience is like, again, Uh, How do our brain and behavior work? Like we're all human. We all do the same stupid things because that's how we're wired. So I'm human. You know, if I go on Amazon and I see that little, you know, swipe here to buy, like I'm going to, you know, impulsively do that sometimes when I shouldn't. And it's not a coincidence that Amazon has that. They've done years of research in how our brains work and what we do. And that's where, again, that behavioral science lens is so Mm. helpful. Um, You know, we're not robots. We're people and humans have all sorts of biases, tendencies, habits that have been adaptable as a species over time. But in our modern world, um, sometimes we do stupid things, right? We do things Mm. that are totally illogical and irrational. And I find a lot of companies and workplaces really forget that we're human and, and really think about people as robots. And they forget about all the silly human things we do and how to design for real human beings. Hmm. That, uh, the trust thing is interesting because I was thinking through, you know, like, yeah, I would like to have all of those things, that integrity and competency yeah. and likability. And that, then I thought, well, yeah, if you are trying to get somebody to trust you, it would be helpful to know 
do they care more about what you're able to accomplish or more about, you know, what you stand for? Like that you could lead with that, right? Or you could uh, maybe give a higher percentage of the time weighted to that. Is the best way to determine what makes somebody trust, you know, or what their ratio is, is it just to ask questions and to listen? Like, how do you do it in a clinical setting? Do you just spend time early on just listening to them? <laughs> or like, you know, what's the best, what's the best way to uncover that? Yeah, that's a great question. So active listening is a technique. When you say be a good listener, you know, I would call that active listening. Again, that's something you can train in how to be an active listener. So, yes, I mean, I think listening for things and what people are telling you, um, a very simple way, let's say you're working with a patient and you want to understand quickly how they trust. You could say, tell me about a positive experience you had in the past with mm -hmm. a healthcare provider and then listen to what they say. And if they lean into the, well, they were on time and they did everything the way they said they would, then you know which way to go. Or if they say, well, this doctor was just so kind and so nice and he really just got me. And Or maybe they say, um, well, you know, they called me, you know, my labs came back and they just called me proactively. And I really felt like they were caring about me because they, they did this proactive thing. So, so asking a question like, what was the best experience you had in the mm -hmm. past? Or what's the worst experience you had? And if they say, well, they didn't do what they said they were going to do. They didn't seem like they cared. They were just, they didn't get me that you can listen for those cues as well. So those are the questions I would ask to very quickly try to gauge what is more important to that individual. It seems so simple, but I don't think we do that very often. And I think that we could easily do that in the workplace too. You know, a positive experience with your last employer or your last customer or with your colleague, I think, or a negative one. You know, I think that that's great advice. And then as it relates to human, you know, and just the, 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 the personal nature, how much does organizational culture impact um, when it comes to creating a place where people feel like they can be humans and not robots? I believe it's essential. And I believe that the pandemic, that is what it is highlighted for us, mm. that we want to show up as human beings. We want people to care for us as human beings. We want human connectedness. And we work. We work a lot. Americans work a lot. So we want that connectedness at work. And we want it to feel human. We don't really want to feel like a robot. So I believe in you know, the future of work, which is really right now, companies that invest in that trust and human, what I would call humanism, infusing more humanism at work. I think that's an investment with a very high return on investment. I think it has mm -hmm. a very ROI right now over the next five years. Um, I don't know if you hear this, George, but I hear this a lot from people. There, there are a lot of people on the verge of hopping to new jobs and they're just waiting for an opportunity. So I think if organizations are complacent and don't infuse humanism, um, it's they're really their talent is very close to leaving. Mm -hmm. And in the future, if you want the talent, I I really believe you're going to have to have humanism in your workplace and you're going to have to spend some time on it. And yeah, I think we yeah. haven't done it before because it takes a little work. It takes time and not necessarily money, but it does take time and intention and it makes us do things or it makes us think about things that might feel uncomfortable. Like I'm mm -hmm. very comfortable in conflict and I'm very comfortable talking about human feelings and having people cry. And <laughs> I'm very comfortable with all that because I trained in it. But most people in corporate culture aren't comfortable with that. And they just try to grab HR and say, HR, come and fix this for me. Whereas I think a successful organization in the next five years is going to be the one that isn't really depending on an HR person to try to infuse humanism. It has to be more than that. Are there, are there areas where an organization, regardless of you know, the type of organization, can you say that there's a large ROI opportunity on humanism yeah. and investing here? Where do you think is the best place to start? What are some examples of ways that an organization can invest in humanism? 
So one of the things I researched, perhaps the simplest and the most complicated at the same time, is um, communication. So, you know, I, I tell a story and I'm sure almost everybody has had this same story happen to them where you get an email message from your boss and it says, we need to talk. And that triggers typically a huge amount of stress and anxiety. So my story, you know, I got one of these messages in the morning and I'm filled with anxiety. What could it be? Why did they send me this message? And I, you know, try to get a hold of them. I send an email back. Nothing comes back. Now I'm thinking, oh my, you know, they're furious. I've done something terrible. And I call them and they don't pick up the phone. I'm like, oh boy, you know, I don't know what's going on here. They're not picking up the phone. And this cycles through my mind and my body all day long. And I don't hear from them until the next morning. I've wasted a huge amount of energy and mindset, just worrying and thinking what this could be. And then the next morning, my boss says, oh, did you turn in this form? And it was nothing at all. And I've wasted a huge amount of my mental energy and my emotional energy. And by the way, probably wasn't great for my body having cortisol and you know adrenaline rushing through me all day long for something that was totally um, unimportant. So something as simple as communication and setting up, you know, good practices and boundaries and ways to communicate with one another that isn't like we need to talk. Um, Something as simple as that shows that you're thinking about the human being. And then in turn, that really, as an employee, I would have saved so much energy and been so much more productive that day had I not been stressed out about this email, which actually didn't matter. That's just a, yeah. one example. It, I mean, it, and it's, again, it's something that seems easy to do, but it's, it's, you know, how often do we fire off an evil and not really think about, you know, reread it and think about the way that it could be interpreted. I'm guilty of that more often than I'd like to admit, but um, yeah, I think just that awareness uh, and, and how we communicate. And there's so many different ways to do it now, because it's not just email, it's, Slack or text or, you know, like there's all these digital ways that we can communicate information. And sometimes we don't get the ability to do it in person where we might miss cues that would have been there otherwise. Right. So we have to be extra aware, I think, today than in the past. Um, you, in addition to being an MD and a PhD, are an author. You've recently published a book called Work yes. Smart. Or you are applying your knowledge of uh, the human brain and behaviors to the way we work. Can you give us some of the key takeaways from that research or tease that book a little bit? Yeah, so it's really just what we were just starting to talk about. Um, you know, it, again, pandemic shown this light on kind of um, the state of work and what wasn't working great. And I was like everybody else. I was trying to find the answers for myself and my team. And I was like, well, what do I do? How do I make this work? I, I had been in an office. I'd been in hospitals and offices my whole career. And I felt like the answers weren't coming fast enough. So I started doing my own research through brain and behavior lens to try to figure it out. And, you know, I found some things that worked. I learned a lot of interesting things. And then when I heard everybody maybe about a year ago saying like, you know, we kicked off, we'll just go back to normal. Um, I started to get really mad. I was like, mm. well, why you used to complain to me all the time about how you hated the office and the communication and you really hated it. So why on earth would you just go back to normal when you have an opportunity to make it better? So I got, I got kind of passionate about it. And then the opportunity came to, um, join a program for first time authors. And I jumped on it and I said, sure, let's do this. And I interviewed a lot of people for the book and I learned more. And so the book really talks about um, how can we infuse more humanism in work? How do we understand human brain and behavior? And, and I try to make it really practical and pragmatic and things that you can use tomorrow um, to make it better. How, how does Belong Health structure? Do you guys have an office? Do you guys work remotely? What's kind of the way of working at your organization? 
So Belong Health um, is an early stage company. So it was kind of born during the pandemic. So Mm -hmm. by default, it started out as a, what we would call distributed workforce, meaning we didn't have a headquarters. We were distributed across the country. And we, as time went on, had to decide what did we want to do? And we made a very intentional decision um, to not have a headquarters per se. So we do have leadership across the country. And then we have partnerships with local and regional health plans. We set up risk sharing, um, typically joint ventures with them in a partnership model. And then we have um, staff that is local to that geography. So we don't have a we don't have a headquarters per se, but we do have density of employees where we are actively partnering with the health plan. Excellent. And the the reason I ask is we're t- we're starting to talk about the future of work being now, and what does yeah. it look like to do work better than before? You know, um, not to go back to the way things were when people were unhappy. And I can say from commercial interiors perspective that before the pandemic, the, the conversation was largely about cost per square foot per employee. How many people can we yeah. get into a space for the least amount of money? Um, there was an investment in physical well-being with height adjustable tables and you know, ergonomic test seating, and people were cognizant of the mental benefits of, of natural light and biophilic design with plants in the workplace. And you know, yes, there yeah. was the amenity spaces, but often it was, let's sit everybody down at a bench, you know, and we can calculate how, many, how much space each person gets and calculate the, the cost of that employee. Now, the debate is, in a hybrid world, A, do people come into the office or do they stay remote? And to what extent? So I'm interested from your perspective, uh, as someone who has studied the brain and behavior, what's the value of being together in person? And what is the ideal situation look like for an organization? And I know that's a loaded question because there's not one answer. <laughs> and that's what we've all figured right. out. But, but from a human perspective, what, mm-hmm. what is the research pointing to? What, what do people prefer? So this is like my favorite topic because there's so much we could say about it. And the model you described of putting people on that bench in the middle, that's actually from, uh, you know, the Ford factory, from Taylorism, Mm -hmm. this concept that, you know, everybody had to be monitored at all times in this uh, assembly line. So that's actually a concept that comes from the Ford factory, where it was very successful. And I believe part of the reason we feel like robots in the traditional office is because it comes from a factory floor model. So it's no surprise that we feel like robots when we're (laughs) you know, in that, in that setting. So, so your question about like, what's the solution or what's next? So the research I've done is that most people, so the majority of people would like to be working in a hybrid manner, meaning that some of the time they are together in person and some of the time they are not together in person. The number, the magical number is going to be different for different groups. So if you have a company that is filled with extroverts who get energy from being together and that's your workforce, you're going to need to be together more. Mm -hmm. If you have a workforce filled with introverts who don't want to be together, you're going to need to be doing independent work more often. Most companies have a mixture. So Mm -hmm. my guidance is take a step back instead of like jumping to the solution. Humans love to jump to the solution, right? Like we're wired that way. We love to just fix it. Instead of jumping to the like, what's the solution? Take one or two steps back and say, what is the work we need to get done? And who are the humans we have to do that work? Mm -hmm. And if you can answer those two questions, that will guide you to what you need to be in person for. So, for example, if the work I need to get done is um, product design that I'm designing, um, you know, chairs, well, I have to be in person probably to at some point manipulate the physical chair together with people. Maybe I need to be together for brainstorming. Many groups feel like, that 
creative brainstorming works better in person. I could argue that that's not always the case, but let's say for your humans, that's how they brainstorm together. And then the times when they need to go and tweak things and maybe work on the mechanics of the materials and all that, maybe they're not together. So if you look at the current research for many types of work, the number is landing at about 20% of the time at work together, which is Mm. lower than most people think. (laughs) Um, And that 20% doesn't have to be like the same day every week. It could be we go together for a week and then we separate for three weeks. Um, Or it could be, you know, we get together intensely for a short period of time and then we go our own way. So I think if you step back and you say, what is the work we need to do kind of in a functional unit? Who are the people? Who are the human beings we have? What do we know about how they work best together? And maybe also add in the layer of like, what is our tech? What can our tech do for us? What can the robots help us with? then that will tell you what you need to do. Mm. So I know most orgs are saying like, well, let's just decide. Is it four days a week? Is it one day a week? And um, I think that's people are eager to make assumptions and jump to the solution quickly, but they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot because Mm. trying to just jump to the solution without asking what you're doing, you're just going to end up spinning your wheels and wasting a lot of time and making people angry and wasting rent and all sorts of costs Mm. to the workplace. You really need to be a little more, I just think people need to be a little more intentional and it's, it's, you know, it takes a little work and people are kind of tired and maybe they don't want to do that work to really think about it. Yeah. I think, I think it's interesting when you look at it from a productivity perspective or you're able to say, we need to design a chair, right? When it, I think it becomes murkier maybe when the objectives become we need to get to a hundred million dollars you know or like when you get to the higher level growth or maybe even innovation goals we need to diversify well what does that mean we don't know exactly yet so we need to figure that out we need to we need to you know gain market share by doing something differently than we're doing now or you go back to what we talked about earlier the trust perspective or the loyalty perspective right. you know why are people leaving organizations they've been home for 2 years you know is it because they want to stay home and their organization's going to ask them back and they're looking elsewhere or is it because we have over the last 2 years lost some of the relationships and the human factor of being together and so we feel less connected to our place of work because we've been isolated at home so i think there's outside of the what you can what what do you need to get done and I think that there's a lot of research around how productive people were from home when they didn't have to commute, you know, and, and then also how productive are they when they're in the office where there might be additional distractions, although we could say there's distractions at home depending on your living environment. But um, what about the human factor, like professional development, having hey. a mentor, learning from others, you know, being pushed because you're training in a competitive nature and the person next to you might, you know, or the synergies that were unplanned. Are there, is there value there? In, is, this, is the research that you're referring to where it's thinking 20% might be, you know, might be the landing spot, is that all being factored in or are they just looking at, at task and accomplishment? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the research is mainly focusing on, they're just trying to aggregate a lot of different situations to mm. come up with a ballpark. But what you're saying is really important. And that's the part with when I said, um, ask yourself, what humans do I have to do this task? That mm. That's where the nuance comes in because some humans are very competitive and benefit from that. Some are not. Some humans trust through, um, you know, likability and spending time socializing with their peers. Some humans, you know, like we're all different humans. And in the past, we would just make these assumptions. And here are some examples. We assume uh, women, we assume women want to work at home because it gives them flexibility. Well, that's not a true assumption. A lot of women Mm. don't want to work at home. I know a lot of women at Chief, you know, the the, uh, group I belong to that say, I don't want to be at home. I want to be away. I want to be in my office where it's quiet. So that's a false assumption. Or we make an assumption that men want to be in the office. Maybe men don't want to be in the office. Or we assume that... um, I'm going to trust you better if I sit beside you every day. And that may Mm -hmm. or may not be true. So 
again, it's kind of like, who are the humans we have? How do we find out quickly what are their preferences and how they work best? And then I think for orgs to start having like a systematic way of putting those pieces together so it doesn't feel so like overwhelming where like, oh, everyone's different. We'll never figure this out. Let's just go back to the office together. Right. Yeah. And I think what you said too about rushing to the solution, I think we were in this forced situation over the pandemic where we didn't have the ability to experiment. We were all had to be, I mean, unless you were an essential, right. you know, you had to be at home. So now as we emerge, time will also help to inform the right, the right mix of what hybrid means, right? Because we're going to be able to look at our workforces and say, all right, well, you know, this year we were at this model and here's the results, right? But let's, let's shift that strategy a little bit. I think where it becomes tricky is when you're making real estate decisions, you know, or investments in your yes. place, you know, then, it, then there's yeah. a number tied to it. So, um, yeah, it will be really interesting. I think that's why people are so eager to hear from their peers, because it's almost like we're in this large so- social experiment right now, and we're all trying to get as much data as we can so we can make the best informed decision for our own organization. So I think the research that you're doing and, the, and you know, you're, you're authoring and publishing it, and it seems like you're continuing to pursue the coaching on it. I, like it's, I think it's really needed at this point. And I, I you know, thank you for sharing it with, with us and with, with others. Um, I, I did want to ask, given everything that you have accomplished, and w- w- where do you find the, the drive and the passion for it all? Like when you were, you, you, you kind of started with Belong Health and you've got this, you, you've got your clinical practice, you've got, a uh, yep. uh, uh, great success. And it, like, w- w- what made you say, hey, I also want to author a book? I think you touched on it a little bit. Part of it was pandemic inspired. But where do you find the ability to keep on saying, hey, I want to do more? Well, you can tell from, you know, looking at things I've done in the past. I'm somebody that, you know, again, know thyself. I try to know who I am as a human being and what makes me tick. And what what makes me tick is um, connecting the dots. So I love mm. connecting the dots in new and unexpected ways, whether that's generating an insight um, for an individual or whether that's um, innovating for a clinical program or whether that's um, helping the workplace, helping people connect the dots. So I really love connecting ideas and people together in new and unexpected ways. That's really kind of what makes me tick, I would say. Um, and I love thinking about the future. I'm an optimist. I'm a futurist. I, I really always believe that humans can do amazing things and we can be kinder. We can be more equitable. There's so much negative media. There's so much negative anxiety in the workplace. Corporate America is always anxious. You know, I think we can be better and I think the future can be bright. But it's going to take a little work and, and maybe we have to get a little uncomfortable. So I hope that the work I do has an impact on individuals, whether that's patients I've worked with, uh, people I've coached, other leaders I work with that belong. And then I hope that I can impact uh, kind of healthcare at the clinical level, like the design and the systems level. And then also this book, uh, you know, I really hope I can inspire people to make things better because. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a futurist, and I hope that my insights and my unique perspective are able to inspire people to take action, not just think about these things, but actually feel confident, like I can do something now and be part of a solution as a part of, as opposed to being part of all of the the negative stuff, which just seems to fill all of our screens and our mm-hmm. days. Well. We definitely need more people like you, optimists that's willing to address hard issues and make a change. I, you know, it's, uh, it's admirable. So thank you for that. Speaking of the future, what's something that you're looking forward to in the next 12 months, professionally or personally? Oh, my gosh. So like I said, I'm an optimist of future. So I have always a million things that I'm excited about. But I think it belong. I'm really excited. I think we are in a exciting growth year. We're going to have some Mm -hmm. new partners to work with, new groups of patients to work with, new healthcare providers to work with. And I feel that we can really bring this humanism and equity 
kinder vision to them. So I'm really very excited about the growth there. Um, I'm excited for healthcare. I think that there's just been, it's not just the patients that are vulnerable. It's really our whole society. I just think we've been so wounded um, over the past couple of years. And so I'm really excited to be at the forefront of what's um, next and, and how to kind of help people handle what with what we're struggling with now. So um, I, I think there's a lot of professional, very exciting things on the uh, personal front. Um, part of what I've learned in the pandemic and I wrote about in the book is creativity has turned out to be super important for me uh, personally and at work. So I'm uh, playing in a band and I've got a whole bunch of creative stuff I'm working on. I have an idea for book number two, so we'll see if that gets going this year. Um, but I, I, I think it's going to be, I'm hopeful that it's going to be a good year where we feel like we can really start to emerge for something, uh, better. That's awesome. What do you play in the band? I'm playing electric bass, which is a new instrument for me. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's, is that what you started college doing? Was that, was it cause you were music, right? No, I was a classical musician. I played, uh, you're going to laugh. I played the bassoon. Wow. <laughs> which is a giant woodwind yeah. instrument taller than me. I played the violin as well, but it turns out that uh, you can be a very mediocre bassoon player and still be the best in the state <laughs> because nobody <laughs> plays it. <laughs> I would, I would so, never have known that. <laughs> That's hilarious. So you learn something new. Yeah. If, yes. you, if you're trying to have your child uh, succeed in music, tell them to play an instrument that nobody else plays and they will do great. All right. That's great advice. Well, we ask two questions at the end of every episode, um, and they're basically just designed to uh, try to get a couple more nuggets of inspiration or recommendations from you. Um, Has there been a resource that has been especially valuable to you in your career, a book, a podcast, a group um, that you could recommend to others? Yeah, I would recommend um, two things. So You've heard me say a couple times here, self-awareness and knowing who you are as a human, I think is critical for every leader, for for everyone. So Mm. I like, um, there's a tool called Strength Finders uh, that Gallup uses. You, anybody can get it online. I think it's maybe like 50 bucks for someone to go get it. You can do it with your teams. It's a relatively low cost, self-explanatory tool. I think that's a great resource. There are other ones out there as well, but that one, I think is, is in the business world, particularly easy to use. It's very good. Yeah. Um, and then, and then I would just say um, for the women that, that are listening, um, there was a book I read called playing big and um, I wasn't expecting to like that book, but it really resonated with me as a woman that um, the, you know, kind of the model that I wanted to be, I didn't really see and it didn't, exist out there when I was growing up and kind of the the premise of the book is you know we can play bigger so it's that that book is aimed towards women but in some ways I think it applies to all of us you know we can Mm. we can think bigger and we can play bigger and and it matters so I like that one too and of course work smart work where can people get that book yeah so work smart Use Your Brain and Behavior to Master the Future of Work is the book title. It is on Amazon, on ebook, uh, paperback, and hardcover. You just Google or just go to Amazon, put Work Smart, and then my name, Jenny Byrne. And uh, I will be doing an audio book, I believe, this summer. I have never done an audio book before. Mm-hmm. They're going to send me a giant setup. I'm going to do my best to crank out that audio book this summer. Very cool. All right, last question. If you were retiring today to go play the electric bass full time, what would be a some wor- what would be a piece of advice you'd leave behind to your predecessor or to, to you know to someone following in your footsteps or just to any aspiring professional looking for increased success? Well, my mantra that I have for myself, I used to say um be uh, be quiet, be humble, and work hard. That's how I grew up. But I have a new mantra, which is be loud, be proud, work smart. So I tell mm-hmm. everyone, be loud, be proud, and work smart. 
great advice. Dr. Jenny, thank you so much for all the advice you've given us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. And again, thank you for everything that you're doing to advance not just healthcare, but the way that we think about work and the way that uh, we treat each other in our professional lives. Thanks for being on Work Inspired. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.